Good morning. Uh, Today I will be reading from Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 12. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, through your evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Thank you, Esteban. Oh, I sound good today. (laughs) Got lots of sound. Well, it's good to have everybody here today. So how are the New Year's resolutions coming? Yeah, mine too. So we've been talking a little bit about being able to share God and, and what that really means. We want to talk about a God who gives today and and what that's like. But this is kind of the theme for the year, is the idea of sharing God and what what that's all about. And we're going to be sharing the heart of God. And the heart of God involves a whole lot of things. And so part of that is being able to share about a God who gives. And so we wanted to talk about that a little bit today and see if we can't get a better grasp on that. Now, every time you talk about giving, it just scares people to death and they clutch at their wallets and, you know, they just get this panic, terrified look on their face. Um, relax for just a minute, okay? The plate has already gone by. It's not coming back again. You're okay. So calm down. <laughs> but I think it is important to understand some things about a God who gives. And, and I think that's one of the best things about God. And it's really incredible. And so the passage that, that was read to us just a few minutes ago, I find to be very, very great because here he just says, ask and it'll be given. Well, I like that. Isn't that great? All you have to do is ask. Ask and it'll be given. And, and then he gives you the other ones too, seek and knock and things are going to be opened up. Now, we realize he did say you have to do something. You do have to ask. You do have to seek. You do have to knock. And, but God's willing to give that. He's not trying to hide it. He's not trying to make it difficult. There's not a lot of paperwork and red tape that go with this. It's a matter of just saying, here's where we are. Here's what needs to happen. And so he's explaining about a God who gives. But he wants somebody who wants it, who's willing to ask who's willing to seek, who's willing to knock, who's willing to say, how is it that I get this? And so it's not just, well, I see you need some, let me dump some on you. It's the people who realize their need and then are willing to go to God and willing to ask God for it because they recognize that God is the one who gives. And so we're back to God being the giver again. And I think that's very, very important for us to realize that God's the one who gives. And then he goes to the next part and he says, if you have a son and he comes and he asks of you. And so the relationship he's talking about here is about our children, about our sons and daughters. Now, it doesn't mean that if any kid on the street comes up to you and says, I want, well, he's not talking about that, is he? He's not talking about everybody in the world. He's talking about children. And so our children and his children. And so to his children, he would say, ask and seek and knock. It isn't that he doesn't give to everybody. Because it does talk about, you know, sun and rain coming on everybody. But the passage we're looking at this morning is for his children the same way as to our children. And I think it's very interesting because he talks about this idea, if he asks for bread, will you give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? This is boys, right? At least I had boys. A snake, really? We could get a snake? I can just see that conversation. But the answer is no, he's not going to want the snake. So maybe it's assuming you had girls. 
I, you know, but it does say sun, so yeah, anyway. That's just one of the discrepancies maybe that you're going to find in this passage. But you're not going to give them what they don't want. You're not going to give them something that's bad for them is the point. And so as you look at we know how to give good gifts to our children, why do we give good gifts to our children? I mean, they don't always do things right. They're not always helpful. They don't always do everything they should. Why are we giving good gifts to our children? You know, especially on those days when they seem to have an attitude. They don't seem to be doing the things that we wanted them to do. Why would we give anything to them on those days? And sometimes you might need to say, clean up the attitude and we'll talk. Uh, but the reason is, we want to see them happy. We want to see them enjoy it. It isn't just because, well, all right, if I have to give you something. No, it's a matter of, I want to see you be happy. And so we'll even come up with things that we think they might like. We'll take them on adventures. We'll want to go and do things with them. This will be fun. Watch, we can go do this. And that's what a parent does because he wants to see that child enjoy this and experience and discover and learn and all those things. And so does God. He wants us to be able to grow and experience and learn and discover, and so he gives good gifts. He says, if you know how to do that, don't you think I know how to do that? And if you're the one that's able to give gifts like that, don't you think the God of heaven would know how to give? How did you learn to give anyway? It starts from somewhere else. It starts because we have a father who gives good things to those who ask him. And so I think that's one of those things that's very, very important when we start looking at how God gives. Because parents want to give to their children. They want to make them happy. They want to see that joy. So then when God gives, does he expect anything back? You know, is there, well, then there's the sense of owing. So God gave to us, now we owe him something. Well, do your children owe you something? When you give to them, do they feel like, oh, well, if you're going to give me a birthday present, well, then I guess I owe you. They don't get it, do they? They don't feel the least bit like they owe us a single thing. Why not? It might be easier on us if they did, but no. Because that's not the relationship we want. We want a relationship that's very open and loving and caring. And so no strings are ever attached to a gift. It isn't that, okay, we give because we want them to give us back something. We want them to behave, so we'll give them something. Now they'll behave because they owe us. And I think some people feel like God is that way. And he doesn't ever indicate that he is. God is not like that. He doesn't give in order to put you in debt to him. He gives in order to empower you, to make you better, to allow you to be blessed. And that's the way we would do it with our children as well, right? That's why we would give to them is in order to allow them to be blessed. So he gives in order to enable. He gives in order for all those things to happen. He's not trying to buy us, and we don't owe him. So that when we get to the, well, you didn't give me any more, so guess we're done. I don't have to be obedient anymore. No, that's not it at all, because he started with the relationship, and that's what he wants. So what is our response to someone who gives such a great gift? It isn't that we owe, but we do respond, don't we? We do appreciate, we do like it, we do respond back to someone. Not because we owe anything, but simply because we appreciate that person so much and God gives us so much. Well, what about giving words? You ever given words to someone? I don't mean in the bad way, okay? Sometimes you have words on your heart and you're going to say them and... Yeah, the other person feels destroyed, and that's not the kind of words we're talking about now. Have you ever given somebody a compliment? Find a lady and say, well, you look nice today. What do you mean by that? 
No, they don't say that. That's the good part. <laughs> or I like your dress. I've already learned sometimes you get in trouble from that. Oh, it's just the dress you like, huh? <laughs> that wasn't what I was trying to say. It's the way you look in the dress. I mean, I'm trying to be the compliment here, trying to give you some sense of that I appreciate, I like, I love. I, it, it's a compliment to be able to give. It's something that's praise. And so sometimes it, we struggle with that. But I think part of what we do in worship is telling God how giving he is. And I think that's what we see so much of the times. We see this especially in Psalms. We see it all the way through scriptures in a lot of different places. So let me just pick a very familiar psalm for you. In Psalm 23, this is one we all know because we hear it all the time. And so it's one of the more famous ones. But I want you to realize what David is saying here. Yeah, he's talking about a shepherd because he used to be a shepherd. No, he's talking about a giving God. And so he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's a pattern that's repeated in the Psalms. And the pattern is people talking about how giving God is. You are my rock of refuge. You are my deliverer. You are my hope. All of those are saying attributes of God. And so as you look at this one, it's an appreciation of God and all of his gifts. It's not about us. It's not about David. It's about how David feels about the things God has given. I have somebody who watches over me. I have a shepherd, and I don't have to worry about anything. I don't have to want. He leads me. He restores me. I'm not afraid at any time, even though I walk through the shadow times even though there are some times that are so difficult and so black and so dark and people die, I don't have to be afraid in those times because he leads me, he guides me, he gives me security, he gives me peace. That's what this psalm is about. It's about a giving God who's giving all of those things. He prepares a table for me. And I love this part. In the presence of my enemies. No, I want a table and, you know, somewhere away from all my enemies. He says, no, 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 no. I'm going to bless you right in front of them. So they will know you have a God that blesses. You have a God that gives. And it may feel awkward. But that's the way he wants to do it. Would you turn down his gift? I don't think so. He says, I'm going to prepare blessings for you in the presence of enemies so that enemies might see, here's what happens when you have a giving God. Here's what happens when God cares for you. And so God gives blessings in hard situations and goodness and mercy follow us. And it's one of those things that you see forever. If you just go to Psalm 24, he talks about how God makes us in purity, about the goodness in his creation, about the greatness of what God has been able to do with our life. And 25 and 26 and 27, just go through the Psalms as you look. They're mainly songs about how good and giving God is. Here's a God who does. Here's a God who, and David is so full of all these words of praise about God because he gives words back to God for what God has done. What an incredible thing. As you look through different passages, let me just read a couple to you. Deuteronomy 8 is a time where Moses is talking about them going over and going into the promised land and things like that. And so in verse 14, he says, I want you to remember 
that I am a God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through a vast and dreadful wilderness that the thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He led you through all that. Yeah, he led you through Arizona, basically. That's what he's trying to say. He brought you water out of a hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known and to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. Well, that's not the only thing. I mean, there, this passage, this type of thing is all the way through. In Judges, just before Gideon, and he's, he's talking to them about that and, and talking about their need for a deliverer again. He says, don't you remember? Why would we go away from God? Well, it's because we forget he's the one who gives. And so in Judges 6, and like verses 8 and 9, he says, I led you up from Egypt. I brought you out of the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, from the hand of all who oppressed you, and I drove them out before you, and I gave you their land. And that's a giving God. I mean, he's given them deliverance. He's given them all these things, and I think that's what's so important, is to realize that we have a God who gives and how great he is. So God gives miracles to those who believe, courage to those with faith, hope to those who dream, and love to those who accept. God is giving. And they had miracles, didn't they? Back in the times of the Old Testament, they had incredible miracles. But they didn't always believe the gift, and they didn't appreciate the gift. They didn't realize it's not by your own luck and skill and goodness that all these things happen. It's because somebody else was blessing you. And sometimes we get resentful of God when, well, why aren't you blessing me now? Come on, how greedy can you be? But that's what we expect. No, I expect more blessings out of a God or else I'm just going to decide you don't exist. Really? That's a way to threaten him. Can you threaten God? Can you threaten a gift out of your parents? If you do, something's wrong. <laughs> I doubt many of them ever give in to a threat from a child. If, if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to misbehave. And I'm going to teach you what misbehave means. <laughs> there are more things that happen with that. We realize we have a good God, and we want to be like him. And we're drawn to him. And so we want to have people that respect us like we respect God. And we realize the way to do that is for us to become givers. Givers of praise. Givers of compliments. Givers of ideas of who people are and what they do. Tell them how good they are because they don't always believe it themselves. We tell them what we believe about them. It's appreciation for people and for who God is. And I think it's incredible that way. We are not victims. Victims just receive all the time. That's all they are because they think, well, I just need, I just need, I just need. And they don't ever see themselves as givers. And so the victim has got that kind of mentality. He just wants to be able to get from somebody else. We're not victims. It's something that we are able to realize. And so God also describes how we are. We are holy. We are blameless. We are righteous. We are forgiven. And God empowers us to be all of those things. If you look at Ephesians 1, here's some of the words that he uses there. He says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Christ Jesus, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. And then he just keeps going and going and going. And Paul is describing, here's a God who gives. Do you realize what all God has done for us and how great it is? 
We're chosen, we're holy, we're blameless, we're loved, we're adopted children of his. We're the living praise of his grace. That's pretty good. We're blessed, we're redeemed through his blood. He has lavished grace. I like the lavish. I don't know how much a lavish is, but that's a lot, I think. Okay, he's lavished grace and wisdom and insight us. And, and, and so that's what a tremendous relationship that is. And that's what it's like when you love someone. You give a compliment and they give appreciation. You give more and they appreciate more. And so you give more and they give more. And it's a never-ending cycle. You can't outgive somebody who is a giver. Because that's just the way they want it to be. And they do it because of who they are. And it's how it is to be loved by God. He gives to us and makes us better, holy, redeemed, forgiven. And we appreciate more with praise and worship. And so we say it. And he gives more blessing. And we become like him and we give more to others. And they give praise to God because of why we did it. Because we did it in his name, not so that somebody would say thanks to us. Because we wanted to give in his name. And they appreciate God and they appreciate us more. And we begin to be blessed. And they give. And we appreciate. And they give. And God is praised through it all. Now the opposite is also true. You realize that. It's the way the world usually functions. We take. And somebody gets angry. And so we feel like a victim or we feel like an oppressor. One of the two. It goes, depends on if you're the dominant or if you're the person who feels victimized. And so it can go either way, but it's the same thing. We become more of a victim or more of an oppressor, and so hate and resentment kind of build up. Resentment if we're the victim, hate if we're the aggressor. I hate these people. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know why it's like this, and I can't get what I want. So we give back retaliation for insult and injury, and they start a fight. And we start respond back with a war. And it just keeps going and going and going. And you don't get out of that cycle either until you've completely destroyed each other. Listen to what Jesus says about this whole thing. It comes out of Luke chapter 6. It's Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, will be measured back to you. That's an incredible passage. He talks about judging and condemning and forgiving. It says, if you don't want to be judged, then don't judge, because it will be exactly the way that you do it. And I've found this to be incredible. I've seen it over and over and over again, that people will come in and be so critical of someone else. And then sure enough, something will happen there in their life, and they're shocked when people are critical of them. Well, they're not supposed to be like that. I know, but you were. You get it back. And every time that you start that process and you feel like, well, it shouldn't be like this, and I'll just point out everybody else's mistakes, guess what? Yours rise to the surface and everybody sees them and everybody knows them and maybe they're too nice to say it. So they don't criticize you, but they know. They know. And you feel it. You go, why doesn't everybody like me? Because you're so critical of everybody else. You get the same judgment back on yourself. And if you, even if they don't say it, they don't like people like that. They like people who are loving and kind and giving. Not people who are hateful and resentful and ready to pick a fight and point out every mistake you ever made. God does not approach us like that. And some people feel like God does, that that's his way of doing things, that he wrote a Bible and he wrote a law, and in there is all the reasons why we are wrong. Just point to any page and pick any passage, and it'll come up with something that says, yeah, you're wrong because of this. And if that's your approach to God, you can use the Bible that way 
to find something wrong about everything that you are. But God is the one who makes holy. God is the one who makes blameless. God is the one who makes righteous. God is the one who gives grace. And his intent is never to point out all your mistakes and condemn you. So why would you do that to anybody else? If we're going to be like God, then we don't condemn. We don't point out mistakes. We don't judge. And then the third one is, when you forgive, you're forgiven. Wow, that's a tough one. The thing about all these two is God tends to overextend. He does more than what we do. And so, if we don't judge, he has no judgment at all. And if we are not critical most of the time, he is not critical of our mistakes. And if we forgive somebody for a little thing that they did, he forgives everything that we've ever done. What an incredible thing it is, because God just overdoes all the rest of this. When we refuse to be judgmental about someone, he refuses to be judgmental about us. When we refuse to be critical and, and condemn people, he refuses to do that with us, but rather extends grace to us. And so you look at what God is able to do. Give and you'll receive. I don't know how you pack it. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. I thought it was a bad thing to spill, but he says, no, it's going to get all over your pants. It's going to spill into your lap. I think maybe that's more like a child who comes up and sits in your lap, and it is such a joy. It is so good. Because you're holding someone who is so loving and gentle and caring. It is our way of asking like children. Ask and it will be given to you. Give and it will be given to you. Hmm. Those kind of seem similar, don't they? They're the same thing. And so to his children, ask and it will be given to you. Or give and it will be given to you. When we become like God, when we ask like God, it's our way of realizing this is what happens. And yeah, sometimes it's giving money in church. Your budget's in the bulletin. That doesn't mean don't take a bulletin, okay? But I have no doubt that that's going to be no problem at all. Okay? We've got two new guys. They're really good. We need them. There's great things going to happen. It comes out of your pocket, by the way. <laughs> so just the hint on that. But I think that's what God does. He's going to give a blessing out of that. And when we give, we are blessed. That's what he's telling us all the way through. When you give, you're blessed. Sometimes in church, it's not money that's needed. It's words of blessing. Sometimes it's just taking care of people. And sometimes it's just putting yourself in a place of giving because somebody in need is going to come along and you're going to need to be able to share God and share the heart of God because God's put you in that place. We don't just keep it all for ourselves. So God gives Adam a garden. I didn't, and he didn't know anything about the garden. He gives Abraham a son and then many sons. And he gives Israel deliverance out of Egypt and a promised land and prophets and kings and Messiah named Jesus. He gives Mary and Joseph a child. He gives the Holy Spirit. He gives grace and mercy and redemption. And none of those are things that we deserve. So how do we respond to someone who would take away all of our mistakes and all of our guilt and say, you don't have any. I see you as an absolutely clean, pure person who is righteous and holy before me. Well, sure, you're going to give back. But we don't give back in order to make up for what he gave to us. We live up to what he believes we can be. 
And so the lists that are in there, I think they're in there so that we can read what he says, I'm giving to you, because we wouldn't believe it if somebody else said it. But he's given us a book full of promises and blessings. It's not for the criticism, it's the promises and blessings of things that he's given to us that says, this is how great a life you can have with me. This is how wonderful this is able to be. This is how great I am and I want to give to you. And so we live up to his praise of us. Read Ephesians 1 and just live up to that praise that he gives to us. Look for those passages. We worship and he lives up to our praise of him. Do you realize that's how it works? He lives up to our praise of him when we worship. It's our way of asking our way of coming before God, coming before his throne, being able to say, here I am, God. I don't know how to ask. I'm just wide open to what you want. And he says, boy, are we going to have fun today? We've got a new adventure. Isn't that great when one of your kids comes up and says, well, I don't know what we want to do, but let's go do something. All right. That's great because you're off on a new adventure. And if we just do that with God, how great that is. It's going to be better than you ever knew what to ask for. But that's what he does. He lives up to our praise of him. Now maybe you think, well, I don't give him any praise. If he doesn't give me anything, I'll say thanks if he does. How sad. Rather, worship is more about his gifts to us and a recognition of those things. And we give worship and God blesses. And we give words of blessing. And we give riches or money that we receive, but we received it from him. And we give appreciation of people and of God. And you realize it all comes back to you. Every thing that you give comes back to you. Maybe not in the same way, so don't think you're going to give away everything in your wallet. By the time you leave, it's all going to be back in there. But there will be people who appreciate. There will be people who care. There will be. And everything that you give, whether it's money or whether it's words or whether it's blessing or whatever it is, whether it's appreciation, it does come back. And so maybe it's time for us to realize what happens with us because God gives his son. His son taught and we received instruction. His son died and we got forgiveness so that we died to ourselves and... He gives covenant and we respond in baptism and in fellowship and in doing good works as givers. So we start that covenant. He's already given first. He gave his son first. He gave redemption first. And it's all sitting waiting. If you haven't done that yet, then man, it's, it's time for you to be able to get in all the gifts. And then you just try to outgive God. There is no way possible. There is so much joy and fulfilled life, it's going to be incredible. If you need help with that, if you're still struggling with that, why don't you come while we stand and sing Let's Talk.